Hi, I'm Dr. Bustai, and welcome to this episode where we'll be talking about um, the core areas of pharmacology, and our focus today will be on the specifics of what makes corticosteroids different. So that's our question. Um, those agents that we use in clinical practice, what makes them different? Why do we pick one agent over another in this particular indication, but we use a different type of corticosteroid in another indication? That's really the, the point of this topic. So if you want to look at it, first you have to think about the fact that it depends on the um, indication and the situation because we have a number of different dosage formulations that correlate to those indications. And you can see here over in this table, we have the various routes of administration and you can see that we have oral administration, IV administration, we can give IM injections, topical, inhalational, uh, inhalation, and then um, uh, intranasal, rectal, and even ophthalmic. And again, that corresponds to the different formulations that they come in, whether it's tablets, suspensions, solutions, creams, ointments, dry powder inhalers that we inhale, um, nebulized so solutions that are used for th conditions like asthma, uh, foams, enemas that are even used in conditions like inflammatory bowel disorder. And so you can see that the formulation uh, not only corresponds to the indication, but also the type of steroid that we may use to help treat that. But what pharmacologically makes the agents different that sometimes drives what steroid is in some of those formulations that we use in clinical uh, practice based on those indications. And so I'd like to look at this uh, corticosteroid chart. If you look over to the far left here, uh, you'll see that this is the drugs and there's two different main categories. Those that are short, considered short acting versus those that are considered long acting uh, corticosteroids. And if you look at the last two columns where we talk about about the plasma half-life of the actual drug in the system versus the biologic half-life, which is what happens once the steroid has bound to the receptors inside the cell and it initiates the biologic response, that cascade of reactions then begins to occur. And even though the drug has left the body, the drug is still carrying on its effects. And so you can see that we have uh, the plasma half-life here is in minutes, whereas the biologic half-life is in hours. And if you look at the long-acting agents, you can see that uh, dexamethasone in particular, budesonide, and betamethasone are some of the longer-acting agents that we use in clinical practice. And they can you know, cover a patient for a longer period of time compared to other drugs like prednisone, prednisolone, and methylprednisolone. So then what else makes them different? Well, the next thing is, is that there have differences in potency. How much drug do I have to get and give the patient in order to exert the pharmacologic uh, effect that we are desiring. And so you can see some of the most potent agents in this group are actually budesonide and betamethasone, followed by dexamethasone being the next most potent. Um, and so what that means is we don't have to give very much in order to get the same effect as a, a higher dose of another medication. So for example, the equivalent dose of prednisone five milligrams is roughly 0.75 uh, milligrams of dexamethasone and that's kind of how you can use that chart there to guide you so for every five milligrams of prednisone that's equivalent to about 0.75 milligrams roughly of dexamethasone. The next and last thing that makes the agents different is their mineralocorticoid activity, the ability of that steroid to cause sodium and water reabsorption and kick out potassium. And the more mineralocorticoid activity that it has, obviously the more sodium and water retention is going to occur. That then raises the plasma volume, which can raise blood pressure. If someone had underlying heart failure, it could certainly cause an exacerbation of their heart failure. You can see why it then causes edema. It can even cause weight gain because of the increase in the accumulation of fluid, which increases the weight over time. And so it's the potency, the mineralic corticoid activity, the half-life that makes them different. If you want drugs that without very, with very little mineralic corticoid activity, that's looking at uh, methylprednisolone, triamcinolone, and then specifically dexamethasone, budesonide, and betamethasone. So some of the longest acting agents are also the drugs without the least, with the least amount of mineral corticoid activity, which may be important if we have a condition where there's already edema, there's already swelling, there's already an accumulation of fluid, and we don't want to make that situation worse. 
So what do those differences really mean and do they translate in anything um, meaningful in, a clinic, in clinical practice? Well, if you look at the various indications, and this slide has got a lot of indications on it, and what I really just want to drive home is when you look at some of the pro in indications of the steroids that are used, for example, like dexamethasone and, and, and uh, acute mountain sickness, we also use it for HACE, which is high altitude cerebral edema. Why is it that we use dexamethasone in that situation as well as in patients with, uh, if you look at uh, bacterial meningitis, you see dexamethasone as one of the preferred agents. Well, why is that? Again, going back to what we were just talking about with the mineral corticoid activity, in these conditions, we have edema. We have swelling. We don't want to facilitate worsening of that swelling. So we'll give a steroid that doesn't cause a much mineralocorticoid activity, which would cause the sodium water reabsorption and facilitate that. Um, when you look at other conditions like asthma, you see methylprednisolone, again, with lower amounts of mineral corticoid activity. You see that same thing with COPD. What about croup? Remember, that's that subglottic sort of edema, um, and we give a single dose to those pediatric patients. Why single dose? One, because the long half-life and the long duration, and two, it's swelling in this, in this little small airway, and so we don't want to facilitate more swelling. Um, and so you can see that across the board, but let's look at the example of, of sepsis. Why do we preferentially need to, or we kind of pull out hydrocortisone when somebody's failed fluid resuscitation, started antibiotics and vasopressors, and they still need some blood pressure increase to maintain their MAPs? Why do we tend to resort to hydrocortisone? Well, it has more mineralocorticoid activity, which is going to cause more sodium water retention, which will increase that plasma volume, which in turn hopefully will increase the blood pressure and the mean arterial pressure that's perfusing the various organs in the context of sepsis if we do end up having to use it. And so uh, hopefully you're seeing that based on the indication, it kind of guides the steroid that's being used depending on what we're desiring in its side effect profile. So some of the core concepts that you should take away, um, getting away from this uh, topic, is that corticosteroids differ pharmacologically based on their potency. How much drug do I have to give? with dexamethasone, budesonide, uh, betamethasone being the more potent. Uh, the plasma as well as the biologic half-life, again, being dexamethasone, budesonide, beclomethasone, betamethasone being the longer acting agents. And then lastly, mineral mineralocorticoid activity. How much sodium and water do they reabsorb? And do you want that or do you not want that? Is it needed because you need electrolyte cor correction or do you not? And so the indication a lot of times drives that choice and it does translate into some clinical meaningful um, reason for utilizing utilizing it. So uh, hopefully you found this to be useful. If you did, feel free to uh, share this with your friends and your colleagues who might also find it to be useful because this is a common question that I get asked a lot of times in, in rounds and in the hospital. And our goal here and my goal is to, one, make, uh, you know, keeping the learning here fun, easy to understand, not only concise, but clinically relevant, evidence-based, and most importantly, oriented to the patient.